Well, good morning, everybody. My name's Paul. Uh, we're going to be talking about opioids and chronic pain today. So, who am I? Um, uh, I graduated from the Hazelding Graduate School of Addiction Studies. I have experience treating patients in residential uh, male and female units, healthcare, professional track, as well as intensive outpatient and outpatient levels of care. Um, I work for LDRC, that's uh, Las Vegas Recovery Center, which uh, specializes in chronic pain and addiction. I work with them for just a little while. Uh, currently, I'm with uh, Reno Sparks Tribal Health Center. So lots of thank yous out uh, to get this thing started. Uh, Joanne, Veronica, AJ, the management team over at Reno Sparks Tribal Health Center, Dr. Edwards for research materials. University of Nevada Reno School of Medicine ECHO program with Dr. Class and Chris and Troy. And Chris working on that marketing material and the website to get all of this uh, up and rolling. Much appreciated. Uh, so without further ado, we'll get started. Um, so how did this start? Let's see. Let's go back one. Let's go back two. There, let's go up one. <laughs> there we go. All right, 1996. Think about that. That's 20 years ago. I also served pharmaceuticals for a number of years, and uh, Purdue Pharmaceuticals financed pain as the fifth vital sign. Is a campaign to help the marketing of oxycotton. Now, here's the difference between the other vital signs. They're actually vital signs. You need blood pressure to live, you need your pulse to live, you need temperature, and you need a respiratory rate to live. Pain is not necessary with or without to live. But when they were able to market pain as the fifth vital sign and to avoid pain at, it seemed like, all costs, um, it was a, a brilliant marketing strategy because they had a pill, Oxycontin, that would help people avoid pain or mask the pain. So this is a successful uh, campaign, and it was actually approved by the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations in 2000. This uh, launched Purdue Pharmaceuticals and the pain uh, medication industry into a uh, wealth of uh, of sales. Where are we now? This is 20 years. We're less than 5% of the world population. We consume over 90% of the global opioid supply. 95% of the hydrocodone produced and there is no ceiling for opioids. So what no ceiling means is the only answer for opioid maintenance therapy is more. Uh, tolerance is built relatively quickly. We're talking about a couple of weeks. In this uh, article from it's, uh, Weighing Your Risks and Benefits of Chronic Opioid Therapy from Stanford University School of Medicine, says uh, more than one half of patients who receive continuous opioid therapy for 90 days are still receiving opioids more than four years later. So this stuff sticks. Uh, people like them, and they do hide the pain. However, they don't make the pain go away. Uh, or actually, uh, we have to look at the risk and benefit for what is the risk for this person being on this medication as opposed to the benefit. When we're looking at risk, we're going to go through some pretty scary stats, and then we'll go into treatment, and then we'll go into uh, optimal care. So when we're looking at uh, drug use as an epidemic, prescription drug abuse is the nation's fastest growing drug problem. 1.3 million emergency room visits in 2010. That's a 115% increase since 2004. Overdose 
deaths on opioid pain relievers surpassed deaths from heroin and cocaine for the first time in 2008. So that just means that the prescription drugs over uh, or surpassed the deaths from the illicit drugs, those two main ones, heroin and cocaine. Look at this. We're all in Nevada. I always like looking in Nevada. We were represented out there in 2003. But as you can see the red, that's the overdose deaths per 100,000. Look at that growth. This is from um, a study in January 19, 2016. You see that and you ask yourself, are we really leaving this a better place for our kids? This is uh, just 11 years, and this is how this epidemic has grown. Every day, 2,700 teens try a prescription drug to get high for the first time. In 2010, nearly 60% of the drug overdose deaths involved pharmaceutical drugs, opioid analgesics such as oxycodone, hydrocodone, and methadone were involved in about three or four pharmaceutical over, overdose deaths. When I, I hear methadone, people think that because it's prescribed, it's not involved in overdose and it's uh, a relatively safe drug. However, it, it is a drug and it is involved in overdose deaths. We have to remember that when uh, recommending uh, opioids drive continued increase in drug overdose deaths. 1980, we had 6,100, and by 2014, we're up to 47,000 uh, overdose deaths. In 2012, the number one cause of death in 17 U.S. states was prescription drug abuse. So we look at traffic accidents, falls, and guns. And drug overdoses are, are bigger than all of those. Here's the thing. Uh, we get national attention when stars die. There's uh, Heath Ledger. I was uh, educated uh, for my master's degree in Minnesota. Uh, Prince is a pretty big deal. Uh, I, I liked him, and to see the talent go that quickly, is, uh, uh, if that's what gets the attention. It's not the thousands of people who are getting the attention, unless one of those thousands of people is a mother or father who is really upset because their kid overdosed and died, and then we have some legal issues as well as ethical issues, etc. Uh, Oxycontin, most recognized and abused form, prescribed to relieve pain, twice as strong as morphine, time release eight to twelve hours. This is where they got. This is where they did it um, with Purdue. They said, "Okay, we have a pain reliever that will take care of you for twelve hours of continued pain relief." So what happens is. There's breakthrough pain after six, seven, eight hours. And instead of saying, okay, uh, here are some other alternatives or here are some, uh, take a, a PRN 20, they say double the dose. And so now what we have is we have really high peaks and really low troughs. What that means is the euphoria for the person taking it, not only is their uh, tolerance building, but they're uh, euphoric, uh, positive uh, enforcement is tremendous. Give you an example. Say you, uh, we have a regular dopamine release. We're cruising around. We're feeling pretty good. It's the morning. Say we're cruising around 100, and we're with our dopamine level. We're feeling okay. Uh, we introduce food. We're hungry. You get a spike of 50 there. You get that spike of 50, and it tells your, uh, your animal brain, I'm going to retain this, and I'm going to do this again. I'm going to eat again. I'm going to drink again. Uh, this feels good. It's for my survival. The sex goes around two and a quarter. 
you get oxycontin and you're looking around four or five hundred. The thing is, with everything else that naturally gets a dopamine release, you don't need or you need to put in effort. With oxy, you just take a pill and you get that dopamine release and it's reliable and predictable and it's going to happen. So what they did now was they said that instead of going longer for this pain relief, so they're, they're projecting that it's going to work for 12 hours now because you went from 40 to 80, but instead it just goes higher. So with that euphoric recall or euphoria, you also have the exact polar opposite so that pendulum swings both ways to withdrawals. So now you have negative motivation because those withdrawals are getting worse and worse and worse. So now the person, when they come to see me, they're not having fun anymore with opioid use. A lot of times they're uh, trying so hard to avoid withdrawal that they're not enjoying themselves at all. Anyway, uh, they crush pills, snort it, cook down, and inject to break down the time release component. Uh, Oxycodone has a strong heroin-like euphoric effect. It's extensive. Other variations, Percocet and Percodan. Opana. Okay, so here's an answer for the doctors. The doctors begin prescribing it over uh, Oxy because it, the scientists, it's a rigorous study, and they, they put together a coding that would deter people and not allow them to break down the pill. They, uh, it would make it into a gelatin, gelatinous form, and so they couldn't shoot it up. If you have an extra computer or get on your iPhone right now, go to YouTube, OP Microwave Method. Try it. YouTube, OP Microwave Method. It'll take a couple of minutes. This kid is at home. It looks like his parents' home. He's using his mom's flower plate. It looks like it's 10 in the afternoon. His parents are probably uh, over, you know, doing something like work. He's got his dad's drill on the kitchen table, and he's got his mom's plate. And with a, his dad's drill and a toaster oven and a, and their freezer, he's able to break through this rigorous scientific uh, breakthrough coding and make the pill into an injectable form. He says at the end it's just for uh, educational purposes anyway, but uh, that will tell you. <laughs> the, the drive, and that, that just tells a lot about our society, about what's going on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the hydro, high dose of hydrocodone narcotic painkiller contains as much as 50 milligrams of hydrocodone. Uh, manufactured as a powder in a capsule rather than a pill, easy to abuse. It's 10 times more powerful than Vicodin. And uh, we, we consume 99% of the world's hydrocodone. NIDA, number of prescriptions written for opioid pain relievers in the U.S. has risen from 76 million a year in 91 to over 2,000, 207 million a year in 2013. It's a thing. FDA granted approval to Purdue Pharma to prescribe oxycotton for patients as young as 11. Now we recognize when the, someone who is 11 years old in the development stages uh, would just look mentally, their prefrontal cortex begins to mature around the age of 25. So if you start somebody as young as 11, and more than half of the patients who receive continuous opioid therapy for 90 days still receiving opioids more than four years later. Are we helping that person or are we uh, condemning that person to a continued life of opioid maintenance? 
If you haven't seen heroin, this is what it is. This is what it looks like. Uh, now, the good stuff is back east. That's that pure um, white powder that's uh, from South America, Afghanistan, Southeast Asia. We get the black tar stuff. That's the junk that comes in from Mexico. That looks like um, tar, road tar or roofing tar, and is really gunky. Uh, it gets its dark color from crude processing methods, leaving behind impurities. So why would somebody go from a prescription pill to that junk? Whenever I talk to somebody, it usually comes down to finances. Your oxys cost about a buck a milligram on the street. So if you have a 240 milligram, and that's only 380s a day habit, then that's 240 bucks. Where you can get your heroin for 15 bucks per bag. If you're going at that volume, you could get it for like 40 bucks for enough to get you high throughout the day. Percocet says eight bucks a pill, Valium seven, Vicodin seven, Methadone. Methadone has a street value of ten dollars per dose. Fentanyl, you really gotta watch the fentanyl. Pure fentanyl uh, will kill you just by touching it. Uh, this is from Haida. So what do we do? Okay, we recognize there's an opioid epidemic. We recognize the danger. We recognize in 20 years we've learned a lot and we recognize now that uh, this is definitely an epidemic proportion. Uh, if you're not seeing him in your, I'd be surprised if you're not seeing somebody in your practice who is, uh, is uh, really in need of uh, treatment or to be weaned off. So CDC new opioid prescribing guidelines is initially try non-drug interventions, CBT or exercise, and says um, if opioids are used, prescribe the lowest effective dose and start with immediate release opioids instead of extended release opioids. What extended release opioids do is they continue the that euphoric feeling until that tolerance level gets up, even though they're being impacted, the person doesn't recognize that they're being impacted because they've been used to, they've gotten their body, if their chemicals used to having that amount of that chemical in their body. So they're still under the influence, but they don't recognize it, which makes their driving or operating machinery doing just about anything more dangerous than it normally is. Only provide the quantity needed for the expected duration of pain. Monitor the patients regularly to make sure opioids are improving pain without causing harm. This is, I, I really like Dr. Mel Pohl, uh, medical director for Las Vegas Recovery Center. Uh, he suffers from chronic pain, and he is able to... Uh, to look at things a little bit differently with the, the treatment services that he offers because he's, uh, he's helping people in addiction. He recommends distraction, yoga, massage, Reiki, mindfulness, meditation, food. So let's concentrate on food for a little bit. There's all kinds of different areas that you can do, and not all of these are going to be uh, a 100% uh, treatment plan. So. I want you to do yoga eight hours a day. Uh, all of these are little bits and pieces to meet the person where they are and make an individualized treatment plan. Pain comes from inflammation. So if you avoid food that causes inflammation and add food that decreases inflammation, you're hitting it in two different ways. You're, you're getting to see where that person really is. So eat foods that reduce inflammation and avoid foods that increase inflammation. Cherries, blueberries, cranberries, blackberries contain anthocyanins, which relieve pain more than aspirin. Vitamin C, used by the body to build and repair cartilage, good for people with osteoarthritis, joint pain. Vitamin C is an antioxidant, can reduce C-reactive protein. 
which as you know is a clinical marker for inflammation. Olive oil contains oleocanthal, which interferes with COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes. Omega-3 fatty acids, salmon, sardines, trout, potent anti-inflammatory agents, and H2O, lots of water, uh, helps the kidney and liver filter toxins, dilutes toxin concentrations in the blood, which reduce inflammatory effects. That kind of makes sense when you think about it. Somebody comes in and they're in chronic pain, you want to uh, start working on that diet. Work on the diet, maybe they lose a little bit of weight. Uh, that would also help. Okay, so what are the bad, bad sugar, bad candy, bad soda, <laughs> alcohol, really bad? Uh, you know, in moderation, if somebody wants to have a sweet, uh, it's better not to not allow it at all. Have them have a little bit of a sweet, but uh, if they understand that all of these cause the body to produce AJEs, advanced glycation end products, which trigger massive amounts of inflammation. When they recognize this, you're actually hurting yourself if you're putting this into your system. Then the patient is likely to be more receptive to uh, avoiding this uh, bad stuff. Food with high glycemic indexes, simple carbohydrates, so you know, the white bread, white rice, which are quickly converted into glucose, uh, alcohol is converted into sugar almost immediately. It also irritates the intestinal tissue and allows bacteria to pass into the blood more readily. And the presence of bacteria will increase inflammation. So <coughs> we've gone over uh, we've gone over this. Uh, Interesting to note, the benefits of short-term opioid therapy is supported by multiple clinical trials. So we don't want to demonize opioids. They're a tool, and they're, uh, they're effective for short-term therapy. However, the benefit of opioids for managing chronic pain is limited. Chronic visceral or central pain syndromes, abdominal or pelvic pain, irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia, headache, neuropathic pain, may be especially unresponsive to long-term opioid therapy. Furthermore, the risk associated with chronic opioid therapy increases in dose-dependent manner. Patients at an increased risk of overdose Include those with medical comorbidities, sleep apnea, lung disease, heart failure. Those receiving benzos or other sedative hypnotics, those with problematic alcohol use, and those with psychiatric comorbidities, depression. Actually, people who are on chronic uh, opioid pain suffer from depression consistently. So working with patients. Say you get somebody in your office or all of a sudden you see this and you think, God, I, I really don't want this person to go down this path. It seems, uh, it seems predictable what's going to happen. Well, if you start right now, if you talk to the patient, here's what, what you can expect sometimes. This discussion is going to take time. So there goes your lunch break. You're going to spend about 40 minutes talking to this person about the pros and cons, about what's going on with them uh, while you're taking away this relationship that they've built with their go-to relief, which is their pill. So it would make the patient upset. The patient's possibly going to complain. If you're on a complaint bonus system, there goes the bonus. Possibly the patient will go to another physician. Here's the solution. You get somebody who's in, you say, okay, we're going to use this as a tool. We're going to help this person. This is what you have to expect. This is what success looks like. It takes about six minutes. You're going to feel, you broke your arm, for example. You're going to feel miserable for a good few weeks. That's the healing process. 
That's pain. That's your body saying, hey, you know what? I'm in the healing process. I am communicating with you so that I can heal. That means that I'm very tender and uh, I am putting myself back together. You know, just a quick aside, there's a disease that uh, people don't feel pain at all. It made us as a, as a society feel so uncomfortable. We picked them up and we put them on an island. It's called leprosy, where people used to chew through their cheek, chew through their tongues, um, rub up against a tree and get gangrene and get infected and then limbs were falling off. So pain is actually here for a reason. Pain is, is a, a message to us. We need pain in our life. We're not, uh, we can, not, we're not into torture, but we can use pain as, uh, as an educational piece when we're going through the healing process. So, here's what success looks like. We're going to start you off on this pain medication. You're probably going to lose some sleep. It's probably going to be uncomfortable. But I'll tell you what, you're going to start physical therapy in the first week. And we're going to get that range of motion going. And it's, it's going to require some work. We've got to get this back to where you were 100%. Now, this is what it's going to look like in a month, in two months, in three months. In four months, we're hoping you're going to have at least 90% of your range of motion. And we're going to titrate you down through that medication. And you should be off of the medication within... You know, that's the doctor's discretion. That's, that's your experience and expertise. You decide with the patient. And then you agree on an exit strategy. If this doesn't work, we're going to try some different things. We're going to introduce um, mindfulness. We're going to introduce distraction. We're going to experiment with a whole bunch of different things to say, okay, this will be optimal treatment for you, the individual. And you have a whole arsenal of things that are available instead of the go-to pain management. So the six-minute talk, define what success looks like, agree on an exit strategy. Addiction is a chronic disease which can be managed but not cured. How do you manage it? There is medication to manage that's available. There's counseling. Uh, most important is uh, support of family and friends. As a physician, you're put in a really precarious position. You have to see now, uh, when I was going around the doctor's offices, they were not seeing nearly as many patients as you are. So you're seeing more patients, and I don't know uh, how the insurance companies are going, but they were really coming in uh, about you know, 15 years ago. I'm dating myself. Uh, and so people are seeing more people, and maybe not making as much. And so uh, when you have these complex cases, what do you do? How, where do you go? Staff complex cases. You're not alone. Get a group of providers or specialists together, and so you can throw out your most difficult patients and staff it. Make the staffing uh, concise and short and don't spend 45 minutes on one patient. I've seen that happen before. But really good staffing sessions, you can get four or five difficult cases done in an hour. And everybody comes together. They know exactly what to expect. They know exactly what to bring. And that allows you to have the peace of mind that you're giving optimal treatment to uh, your patient other providers add insights for optimal care. Qualified expert physicians give different perspectives to medication management. And a diverse group of professionals helps the doctor make the correct decisions. Time limit staff weekly or monthly. Medications, methadone. Methadone is available. Uh, it's the oldest one. It's the oldest medication that we have for, um, for maintenance. It's a full agonist at the mu opioid receptor. It has street value like we talked about before. 
possible overdose. He can change cardiac electrical conduction, producing prolonged QTC intervals, continuous dosing that's for years. So I asked somebody, what's their, uh, what's their exit strategy and they're on methadone? And uh, it's like, what do you mean? And when, when are you planning on being off of this? Oh, I, I think I have like five years. Five years, okay. So for looking at five years, if you do anything for five years, the, the uh, description of being an expert in any area is putting in 10,000 hours. So for five years, you take 40 hours a week. Say there's 50 weeks in the year, you take two off for vacation. That's 2,000 hours. So you're taking that person's potential away so that they can be on methadone, which you have to titrate up to. And the logic is, if they're feeling like they're on something, they won't commit crimes to get more heroin or won't shoot up. And if they're not shooting up with 30 needles, they won't get uh, HIV. Um, methadone can work as a tool. Just be uh, careful with the amount of time that the person is on methadone. Buprenorphine is Suboxone. That's a partial agonist at the mu opioid receptor and partial antagonist at the kappa opioid receptor. It'll displace the other opioids in the receptor causing withdrawal. It has a street value because it does uh, get people feeling pretty high and you can titrate down this quickly. Uh, in Hazelden, Betty Ford, we were on a, a core 12 group that was a comprehensive opioid response uh, group. This is, this is about five years ago when we were working on this for the opioid epidemic. And they are into uh, medication-assisted uh, detox. Again, not into torture. You don't want to torture the person. You want to get them off of it but you have to titrate down quickly, and that's uncomfortable sometimes, but they use uh, Suboxone. Uh, now, Trexone, 28-day new receptor coverage, no street value because it does not get you high. Uh, what now Trexone is used for is it's a deep muscular injection, and it can cover the mu receptor coverage for uh, almost a month, and the thought process there is, if you're covering the mu receptors, even if the person tries heroin or tries an opioid or even alcohol, they're not going to get the euphoric effect. If you're not getting the euphoric effect, then, and you know that you're not going to get the euphoric effect because you have these mu receptors covered, it can be a deterrent. Uh, I, I hear some people talking about uh, giving it to people who are being released from prison uh, for drug abuse uh, offenses maybe one or two months before they get out and then after they get out and are transitioning into an environment that hasn't changed at all, even though they're really trying to change, this can be a bridge to help them uh, for three or four months afterwards. Uh, Naltrexone is called Vivitrol. Counseling, CBT. Uh, this is uh, National Institute of Health, well-established treatment for pain that involves helping the person improve coping skills, address negative thoughts and emotions, and can amplify pain, and learn relaxation methods to help prepare for and cope with pain. It's used for chronic pain, post-operative pain, cancer pain, and the pain of childbirth. Many clinical studies provide evidence for the effectiveness of this form of treatment in pain management. It's a part of it. Uh, what happens with uh, addiction treatment is, I, I thought when I first started this, that we're, I'm going to help people get off of junk and get clean and sober. Well, kind of, uh, but that's called detox. There's different levels of care. There's detox, that's the first level. You get all the junk out of their system. 
Then there's residential, that's 24-hour medically monitored care and structure. And that lasts for, that's the 28-day program you usually hear about. Then there's IOP, intensive outpatient. So see how we're titrating now? That's three hours a uh, session, three times a week. There's also a family component and individual counseling. And then there's outpatient, which is three hours, two times a week. So everything's going, again, to help them move into their environment and live a clean and sober life. The way that addiction usually strikes is, it comes at the person spiritually, then it attacks them emotionally, then mentally, and then physically. When it manifests physically, it's pretty uncomfortable to look at. So we get that person detox. The healing process goes the exact opposite way. First, it's physical. Then the mental comes back. When that mental comes back, the person's able to remember what happened yesterday or, heaven forbid, the week before. Then we're having some big breakthroughs. Then emotional. That's where I spend a majority of my time. That's where I'm working with depression, anxiety, relationship issues, anger issues, just all the issues that life can bring. Eventually we get to spiritually. But it takes time to walk into the forest, and it'll take time to walk out of the forest. So all of this takes time. Uh, we'll go on to the, let's see, support groups can provide an important supplement to drug and surgical treatment. Uh, support groups are really important because they get non-judgmental um, people who can relate to them. Parents tend to become more of a policing entity. Uh, spouses tend to become more of a policing entity. When People are together in a group where other people are not judging them and can relate because they've been doing the same thing. Uh, they tend to open up more, and it's more productive uh, in the healing process. Distraction. If somebody's going through a, a trigger, you're not going to be able to, if the liquor store is a trigger or the corner that you used to buy your dope is a trigger, you're not going to be able to move that corner. You're not going to be able to move that liquor store. You have to change the perception internally so that you can deal with, uh, with everything that's not changed. So distraction is one way. Coping with triggers. Music therapy. You know, music therapy, think about this. We're thinking about our thoughts when I say think about this. When we think about our thoughts, we can change our thoughts. Think about your favorite song. Did you choose that song to be your favorite song, or did it just happen? Have you ever recognized when you hear the first note of your favorite song, it immediately puts you in a mood? Your brain doesn't have time to screw it up. That's where music therapy helps. Art therapy, wonderful distraction, gets the person involved in something that they like. Because what we're doing is, we're taking away a relationship from a group of people who are generally very loyal and very caring and very empathetic and very sensitive, and we're taking away their go-to. We need to replace it with something that's healthy and fulfilling for them. In order to do that, we have to explore what is healthy and fulfilling. In order to do that, we have to lay out a smorgasbord and say, hey, experiment. And be okay to fail. It's all right if you're not Picasso right, right out of the gate, but get dirty with the paint. Mindfulness. Mindfulness is great. Breathing techniques. If you can get somebody to feel a little bit of peace and serenity and recognize what that body feels like and have the body communicate with the mind, then you're making progress. Mindfulness, I mean, you got to breathe anyway. You might as well use it. Uh, as a tool, yoga, massage, physical therapy, psychoeducation, mind-body connection, visioning, visioning. Here's one that I use uh, a, a lot, especially with uh, younger people. Older people get uh, something out of it, too. Solution-focused is imagine yourself five years from now. What do you look like? What are you doing? Define your life. What are your beliefs and values? 
Have you been consistent with your beliefs and values for the last five years? What's leading you on this path? You know, we hear about gateways for drugs. They're more like pathways. If we can start visioning and start moving towards our goals with support, then we have a higher level of success because the person is internally motivated. Because I'll tell you what, with this group of people who have been on the street and doing street drugs and uh, not really proud of some of the behaviors that they had to, uh, to do because of these drugs, uh, you can't scare them into anything. They have to move towards it. They're actually fearless. They have to buy into it, they have to believe it, and they have to move towards it. And once they do, then there's no stopping them because they take all of that resilience, all that persistence, all that loyalty, all that creativity, all the beautiful aspects that they have, and they put it towards more productive, um, and they become assets to the community. Uh, I had, just a quick aside, I had one guy I was working with, he was in the heroin, 14 rehabs, and he got it the 14th time. People want to throw in the towel at 10 and 11. Sometimes that's too much. He's running the clinic now. I say, stay with them. Hang with them. Let them know support. Now, we're going to be firm, and we're going to let you know, hey, this is no bueno. This is abstinence-based, or we have a plan if you're going to be using. But uh, I'm going to walk with you, but you're going to lead the way. And always appreciate that you're part of their team. So this is counseling. So this is where I, this is where I do my thing. Uh, provide coping skills, self-empowerment to heal spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically. Support family and friends. Education, psychoeducation is really important. They want to know what's going on with their body. Because when somebody's using, they're thinking about the compulsion. They're thinking about getting high. They're not thinking about... What is that smoke doing? But if they can be like the, the star in their own movie and watch themselves smoke and then visualize that smoke going into their body, through their uh, throat, into their lungs, impacting their brain, sometimes that's enough to deter them from uh, picking up for that time. Uh, communication. Constant communication, transparent communication, and honest communication. A lot of times at this level, when people come in, they, uh, I, they lie for who knows why. Uh, the truth would serve them better, but they, they're just in a constant lie mode. Uh, care for the family. Uh, a lot of times, they, the women that I work with, they won't really do a lot of things for themselves but they will move mountains for their kids. And so when we present it to them that they're not really doing it just for themselves, they're doing it for their family, they're doing it for their kids, uh, a lot of times that's a love that you need, that's a level that you need to have the breakthrough that you need. Uh, here's my contact information. Had a vignette that... Uh, ran a little bit long, so what I wanted to do is uh, review what we look for in um, substance use disorders. This is according to DSM-5. This is what we, uh, one of the tools that we use to give us an idea of where the person is. Now, when we're looking at a person, they come in, there's 11 criteria on the DSM-5, and that's going to tell us if they're mild, moderate, or severe. Mild substance use disorder has two to three of these criteria. Moderate has four to five, and six or more is severe. Keep in mind, there's a lot of stuff that goes on with this information. That's why, before we get into it, and just want you to recognize that there's the skill of the therapist. There's the safe environment that the therapist is providing. 
is the ability to ask questions in a conversational kind of way. There's uh, then the patient side. You got uh, can they remember everything? Um, are they feeling defensive? Are they giving up too much? Um, there, there's all different kinds of things that go into getting the getting this information that we have to use to document to justify seeing the person to I don't know the insurance company or whomever. But when we're looking at this, we have to make sure we're not labeling anybody. We have to take all these things into consideration and say this is as accurate an information as was able to be given at this time. And the wild thing about the criteria is they're supposed to change. So, 11 symptoms of opioid use disorder. Are opioids taken in larger amounts or over a longer period than was intended? If yes, that's one criteria. There's a persistent desire or unsuccessful efforts to cut down or control opioid use? Yep. A great deal of time is spent in activities necessary to obtain opioids, use opioids, or recover from its effects. Craving or a strong desire or urge to use opioids. Recurrent opioid use resulting in a failure to fulfill major role obligations at work, school, or home. Number six, continued opioid use despite having persistent or recurrent social or interpersonal problems caused or exacerbated by the effects of opioids. Important social, occupational, or recreational activities are given up or reduced because of opioid use. Recurrent opioid use in situations in which it's physically hazardous. Opioid use is continued despite knowledge of having a persistent or recurrent physical or psychological problem. It's likely to have been caused or exacerbated by opioids. And tolerance. And then withdrawal. So what I'd like to do, are there any questions? We have about 10 minutes. There's no... You hear me? Hi, yes. Hey. Hey, you saved me from reading. I was going to go through a thing. Um, thanks. Um, I had a question. Um, I'm Peg Nicholson out at Jackpot Community Health Center. Hi, Peg. Hey, it's very rural, and there are not many alternatives um, such as counseling or things like that. I can't, either my patients can't afford it or I can't get them before 45 miles up the road to the nearest city. Um, I'm dealing with a lot of elderly patients that have been on opioids for, um, for pain for years, uh, generally from failed uh, back surgery or uh, spinal collapse, things like that. Um, I'd love to wean them, but I'm very nervous about putting them on NSAIDs uh, considering their um, comorbidities. Uh, any thoughts of, of what I can do to at least stabilize or reduce doses and give them something of value uh, beyond the opioids? Yeah, uh, I would be staffing, or, or I'd recommend staffing with a geriatric uh, specialist. Uh, internal medicine. And how old are they? Uh, how old are they? Yeah. Uh, anything from 70 to 80. Any with uh, uh, HIV, uh, chronic uh, heart conditions, uh, end of life. Uh, definitely uh, uh, no HIV, definitely chronic conditions like COPD, um, uh, well, heart issues, I, I mean the t We lost you, Peg. Hey, this is Diane. Um, I'll give you a little bit more background about Peg's patients. Jackpot's on the Idaho-Nevada border. 
up north of Winnemucca. So there are no specialists of any sort. Peggy is the only medical care in the whole town. <laughs> the next closest big town is um, Twin Falls across the border of Idaho. So some people jump back and cross, back and forth across the border when they're looking for their pain medication. So if she just checks the Nevada PMP, they may actually be also getting medicine up in Idaho. Um, and then Winnemucca is her next largest town, which is quite a ways away from where she's at. So there are no internal medicine. There are no specialists. And I believe she probably does not have hospice there, which is what I think you're heading towards. It's um, that's just correct. a very, very small town. So she is it out there. So that's why what you're giving her is very important. It sounds wonderful. Uh, another thing is, uh, you know, I'm going to ask to Chris real quick. <laughs> About the staffing, is that going to be uh, the Project Echo has some uh, some programs that are coming up where they actually might uh, have some staffing available for the rural clinics, and this is exactly the type of thing that would be beneficial, where we could get a psychiatrist. Uh, uh, geriatric physician, uh, cardiologist, it sounds like, really needs to be involved in this, uh, specialists together that could actually staff with uh, uh, for these patients. We do have a geriatric one. She, um, Peggy works for Nevada Health Centers, so they obviously have many rural clinics across the state. Um, so that would be helpful, uh, but there's really not enough of a demand for a specialist to actually go there more than maybe once every couple months. And then it would be like this. It would be a webinar. Okay. Right. So, yeah, for, for um, webinar, then that would work great for her out there, except for that she doesn't have very good Internet out there. Great, <laughs> <laughs> great, great. <Yeah. laughs> um, that can be a, a difficult um, issue there. Um, but... Um, yeah, it's it's very interesting when when you're out in a and technically she's in a almost a frontier area instead of a rural area. They don't have a regular grocery store. There's no Walmart. There's no pharmacy or anything like that. She has a small dispensary there. And um, her other issue is that a provider that's two or three providers before her was very lenient with pain medication. So the person that she's following tried really hard to try to cut some of these patients back. And so obviously she's working on trying to do the same thing. But they're working on a legacy of a provider probably three, four years ago that was very, very lenient and gave pain medicine right and left. And so they're trying to combat and get, get people weaned off of that. Well, it sounds like a normal story then. Yes. That's consistent. Yeah. You're not alone. Peg, there are uh, several echo clinics that uh, we have specialists on hand that would be able to assist you with some of your strategies to deal with those patients. Um, I can touch base with you later, but we do have a geriatric clinic later in the month that's on the third Wednesday from 12.15 to 1. And these are also listed on our schedule on our website if you have time to look at it. Um, we have a behavioral health and primary care clinic that will be on the 9th of September, 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock. And um, both of those clinics would be really excellent places to bring this topic up. So, and then um, the geriatric clinic is going to be dealing with polypharmacy in the near future as well. Right. Okay. You're welcome. Question. Yes, Hawaii. Question. Yeah, uh, this is Dr. Adams, Hawaii. How about uh, Epsom salt, mineral baths, hot springs, dirt cheap in all the stores, magnesium's natural ca calcium channel blocker. It opens up the blood vessels, reduces increases blood flow, reduces inflammation. That is wonderful. That's exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. 
That is usable. <laughs> That's perfect for the arsenal to help people, uh, and, and they can do it in their home, and uh, yeah, absolutely. We've got about five minutes if we want to wrap up. That's about it. Uh, any other comments or suggestions? Okay, if you know anybody who needs help, have them contact myself, have them contact Chris. Uh, again, thank you all very much for being here. Uh, appreciate it. And as always, thank you, Chris, Troy, Dr. Class, for uh, Project Echo and all you do for everybody. And uh, don't forget, we do have the Diabetes Case Consultation Clinic coming up on September 1st. Um, that clinic isn't going to have any didactic to it. It's going to be 100% case consultations. So if there's any of your patients that you'd like to have um, uh, to present in order to get the treatment started, um, get those cases sent in to us. Fax number is operable again, so apologies if you tried to fax something in the recent past and it hasn't gotten into us, but um, Yep, September 1st, Diabetes Case Consultation Clinic, and then the regular Diabetes General Underpin Clinic is going to be um, on its regular schedule, which is the third Thursday from 8 to 9. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. This was very helpful.